Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's MPG Primer. We are very excited to have Wei Zhao here, who is going to speak about phenome association, phenome-wide association studies in the UK Biobank, which I think probably everyone has thought of a way that they could use the UK Biobank to help answer a question in their science. So we're really excited to hear from her. Uh, she's a new assistant investigator at MGH and a faculty member at the Stanley Center at Broad. Uh, she received her PhD training at the University of Michigan and did her postdoc here with Ben Neal uh, and Mark Daly. Wei's research mostly focuses on developing and applying statistical models for genetic studies of human disease and traits in large data sets. So we are very excited for her talk today. Uh, she's glad to take your uh, questions during the course of the talk. So please feel free to come up to the mic if you're in the room um, or go ahead uh, and put your question in the Q&A and we'll voice it for you. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, uh, so um, in today's talk, we'll talk about the phenome-wide association studies in biobanks. I'm going to mainly use UK Biobank as an example. Um, at the beginning, I would like to uh, do some clarification on terms that we're going to use in the talk. So most of us are very familiar with GWAS, uh, which has been uh, widely used to identify genetic variants associated with phenotype of interest. What we usually do is we'll use uh, linear or we'll generalized linear models to model the relationship between genotype and the phenotype while adjusting for other covariates such as age, gender, and ancestry PCs. So based on these models, we can conduct statistical tests to test whether the genotype has non-effect, uh, non-zero effect on uh, the phenotype we're studying. So in this plot, we're plotting the negative log 10 p-values for each genetic marker across the genome. Uh, so the higher the dots, the more significant the association is. And so here's uh, how we conduct the GWAS. Usually we have a phenotype. It can be a human disease or trait of interest. And we try to scan the genome to see what, which gen genetic markers have genotype association with this phenotype. And as a inverse of the GWAS, we have uh, FIWAS, uh, in, which is the phenome-wide association study. And usually we have uh, one genetic variant of interest where we want to see which human disease or trait is a, has an association with this genetic marker. So in fact, we're still using the same statistical model to uh, test the association, but we have uh, a different plot here is called um, FIWAS plot, and each dot now is a human disease or trait, and we're showing uh, the associations, that were associations with the genetic marker that were interesting. So as the computation cost and also sequencing cost drops and uh, the creation of biobanks in the world, we now have access to a wide variety of clinical data which allow us to you know, study any human disease or trait in biobanks to uh, obtain gen genotypes for those biobank participants. So we have this phenome-wide, genome-wide association studies uh, conducted in biobanks and we call it uh, FIGWAS. And as a result, we can see that uh, we can conduct a GWAS for hundreds of thousands of human diseases and traits and we all, they also allow us to actually uh, conduct a FIWAS study for any of the genetic markers. So we, you can say that we, have, we can conduct a genome-wide FIWAS in biobanks as well. And uh, you, can, um, you may see the FIWAS has been also used for phenome-wide GWAS in some talks and papers, uh, but these are the terms that we're going to use in today's talk. So um, I'll start with a brief introduction to biobanks, and we're going to, we're going to talk about phenome-wide GWAS, uh, including the challenges we see in the analysis and the tools that we have developed to address those challenges. And then uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, feed GWAS resources that have been created by large biobanks, as well as for uh, those visualization. And at the end, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, meta-analyzing biobanks to increase our power uh, for genetic discovery. So first, uh, biobanks usually have hundreds of thousands or up to millions of participants with consent for research. And uh, we have uh, you know, a variety of clinical data, uh, the billing codes, questionnaires, uh, physician's notes, 
drug prescription imaging or registry-based data. So by, clean, by linking the uh, clinical data to genetic data of those participants, biobanks create a really rich resource for us to conduct a genetic discovery. So UK Biobank is the you know, most familiar biobank to us. Uh, it, it was established in 20, uh, 2007 in the UK, and they recruited half a million participants across UK. As we see that they have all different types of clinical data, and they generated genetic data by DNA array, followed by imputation, and in more recent years, they have done whole exome and whole genome sequencing of their participants. And another example, the FinGen project, uh, which have uh, recruited and genotyped 10% uh, of the population. And in FinGen, we have um, a long history of uh, health records. We can see it can go back to 1953 and with different types of health data. And the all of us here is the ongoing uh, biobank uh, work. And we can see also we have a survey and EHRs and different uh, genotyping array and the sequencing data. And uh, one example I want to mention is the HUNT study, which is a biobank uh, in Norway that I have, I have spent most of my PhD time working on. And uh, they create all the participants from a small county in Norway, and it's a po population-based and longitudinal study. And the uh, most, most important feature is that the population is quite homogeneous, which means we have very heavy sample relatedness in this biobank. And another one, a very important one, the MVP, uh, that they have uh, more than 600,000 of participants from four different ancestry groups. And uh, Dr. Anurag Lerma, who will give an MPG talk today, will talk about the phenome-wide GWAS on MVP. So I've listed several uh, important biobanks, but we have more biobanks in the world, and we're trying to map them here, uh, 30 biobanks here. We're definitely missing many. And just by putting 30 biobanks together, we, we have uh, more than 2.4 million participants with genetic data, which is a great resource. So as we can see that uh, when we have access to these biobanks and we start doing phenome-wide GWAS, which actually starts the next wave of genetics uh, discovery for complex human disease. And uh, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, how, how do we curate phenotype, phenotypes based on the clinical data using UK Biobank as an example. So um, as we see that, although we have different types of clinical data available, and I see the most common form of curating phenotypes is using the uh, ICD codes. Um, based on the fee code map. So uh, fee code table has been um, invented in 2010, and initially it's, it was for fee was, and but then it now commonly used for us to curate phenotypes corresponding to human disease based on ICD codes. As you can see that the uh, fee code has hierarchical structure, and we have the parent code and followed by child code, adding some uh, granularity. And here's an example that if we want to study type 1 diabetes with ketoacidosis, and we use the fee code 250.11. And then we can, based on this fee code, and then it, ca it contains a list of ICD codes um, it, that we can map to this fee code. And then we can define our cases in the, in the GWAS study based on who has this fee code. Uh, two or more occurrence on different uh, dates. And then uh, at the same time, uh, fee code also help us have cleaner controls. And we want to exclude any participants that even though they do not have these, uh, this fee code to become cases, but they have uh, different types of diabetes. So we would like to exclude those participants with any fee code that in this range. So we have, we, we have like cleaner controls. So this is how we use um, fee code and based on ICD codes to define our cases and controls. And here's the example that if we define the case control uh, samples for uh, this phenotype and we can conduct the GWAS in the UK Biobank, as we see that even though we only have 237 cases and we are able to identify the HLA locus along with several other loci.
So um, as we can see, uh, there are many advantages of using biobanks to study genetics of human diseases. Uh, it is definitely more cost efficient than, than the traditional disease-based cohorts. Uh, in those studies, we usually collect uh, you know, two groups of people who do have the disease, who do not have the disease, but the data sets can only be used to study that disease or uh, several other, several like relevant diseases. And then uh, we can, from that example, we can see that biobanks do allow us to uh, conduct GWAS in those understudied diseases because of their low prevalence in the population. And uh, we are going to also talk about how, you know, uh, biobanks, when we conduct a, a hundreds of thousands of GWAS, we can do um, uh, genome-wide FIWAS actually allow us to understand the cross disease and cross trait associations. And here's an example. It, this is a variant uh, associated with schizophrenia. As we can see, if we pull out the FinGen results and then take a look at the FIWAS plot for this variant, and it is not only associated with some psychiatric disorders, it is also associated with hypertension and arthrosis. And more interestingly, uh, if you take a look at the direction of the triangles, which is corresponding to the direction of the effect sizes, you see uh, the um, effect direction on the risk of uh, psychiatric disorders and, and arthrosis is opposite to the, uh, the effect direction of uh, the risk of hypertension. So I think this example that shows us uh, how biobanks enable us to have a more uh, comprehensive understanding of the effects of those genetics on overall human health, which is quite important for later treatment development. So um, from there, um, I would like to start talking about phenome-wide GWAS in biobanks in more detail and including uh, different aspects. Uh, so uh, yeah, please feel free to interrupt me with any questions. <laughs> okay, so let's continue. Um, I would like to start with one example that uh, I uh, started, like conducted GWAS for colorectal cancer in UK Biobank. Uh, when I was a PhD study uh, or PhD student in Dr. Christine Wheeler's group at University of Michigan. So here I try to uh, study colorectal cancer and we can see like based on the fecal mapping and we have about 4,500 cases in UK Biobank. And the first challenge we, when we try to conduct GWAS for this phenotype is that we see related samples in UK Biobank. So on average, um, one in three UK Biobank participants has at least a one up to third degree relative who is also in the UK Biobank. And that means that we um, cannot no longer use the uh, linear regression model for our GWAS, which assumes the independent observations. Uh, if we use linear regression model with, the, with those sample relatedness, then we will see inflated type one errors uh, in our results. So our solution is that how about let's use linear mixed model and compared to linear model, we have this extra term B here, which is the random effect, uh, gen genetic effect. And as we see that B follows multivariate normal distribution and the variance matrix is corresponding to the genetic relationship matrix GRM. So in this matrix, we can, um, it, it, it represents like each element represents how far or how close each two sample uh, samples are related to each other. So by using linear mixed model, we'll, we're, we're able to account for sample relatedness. And as a student at that time, and we, uh, I just uh, did a literature search uh, of the existing linear mixed model methods. And uh, the BOAT LMM, which was developed by Peru Lu uh, in 20, 2015, was the only one that is scalable for the UK Biobank um, sample size. So let's use both MM for our GWAS. And we, what we saw is that we see lots of uh, spurious signals across the genome in the Manhattan plot. And uh, we start asking why. And uh, so we're thinking, oh, maybe we, should, we shouldn't use linear mixed model for binary phenotypes. So basically linear model assumes the constant mean variance relationship that is uh, represented by the orange line here and the true mean variance relationship for binary phenotypes is represented by the blue curve here. So um, 
Chen and Wang et al. in their paper has shown that using logistic linear model for binary phenotypes, GWAS can have some inflated type one error. So uh, fortunately, and Chen Wang et al. has developed this R package called GMAT that implemented logistic mixed model for GWAS of binary phenotypes. And uh, so that's it's a R package, and then how about using GMAT? So the biggest challenge we have is the it's not scalable for UK Biobank's uh, data sets at, at all. And we can see that even for one GWAS, we'll, we'll need very huge memory and more than 180 CPU years to conduct the GWAS, which means we need to optimize the logistics model. Uh, what we did is we uh, learned and leveraged the similar optimization strategies that Peru did for both MM and to optimize the logistics model for UK Biobank scale data. And then we can apply it to our GWAS. And we still see lots of spurial signals uh, for colorectal cancer. And what, what's missing here and why is, the, why is it? So it turns out that one main reason here is the unbalanced case control ratios of our phenotype. As you can see, uh, unbalanced case control ratios are commonly observed in biobanks when we try to curate our phenotypes based on SD codes or clinical data. And we, ha we tend to have much more uh, controls than cases. Uh, his example in UK biobank, 85% of the phenotypes that out of uh, 1,600 binary phenotypes we curated using fecal have case control ratio less than one to 100, which means they have you know, prevalence uh, lower than 1%. And uh, when we have unbalanced case control ratios, and we see that the test statistics here, more specifically, we're using score test, and do, do not converge to normal distribution anymore. Uh, so if we still assume them, they follow the normal distribution as the dotted line represent here, and we'll get inflated type one errors and inflated p-values. So um, our solution is, let's use um, the method called settle point approximation, SPA, to more accurately approximate our test statistic distribution. So compared to normal distribution, which only use the first two moments, mean and the variance, and assumes the sym symmetry of the um, test statistic, SPA can use the entire moment generating function, actually give us a you know, more accurate approximation of the test statistic, and which then give us more accurate p-values. And SPA was initially proposed by Daniels in 1954 and was later used by uh, Day et al. Uh, in 2017 to, uh, to account for unbalanced case control ratios in regular logistic regression. And then here we adapted it in our biobank GWAS to try to uh, account for this uh, unbalanced case control ratio. So here uh, I've talked about three different challenges we see and how we try to address these challenges, and then we develop the, our method called SAGE to uh, account for uh, these, these challenges under the guidance of my PhD co-advisors, Dr. Shan Li and Dr. Uh, Christian Wheeler. And we can see that now uh, we have quite clean Manhattan plot, and uh, we have identified three well-known loci for colorectal cancer using the UK Biobank data. And here are two more examples. Uh, one is the CAD, have more balanced case control ratio, and then the other one is thyroid cancer, which have more unbalanced case control ratio. So as we see that for CAD, actually both MM does uh, fairly well, and GMAT, uh, which, GMAT uh, which is the like, faster impl implication, has uh, you know, fewer spurious signals here, and SAGE got a quite clean Manhattan plot as expected. And another example, thyroid cancer, as we can see, uh, it only has 358 cases. And if we conduct a lin using linear mixed model for this GWAS, we see like very messy Manhattan plot and the signals everywhere. And then let's try logistic mixed model, a similar plot, but if you take a look at the maximum value of y-axis here, uh, it actually drops from 200 to 100. And then let's use SAGE that we have identified you know, one well-known lo locus with very clean Manhattan plot, uh, even though we only have 358 cases. And so uh, we published SAGE in 2018, 
and then we applied it to the uh, 1400 fee code from UK Bio Bank and across the you know, top med imputed and the HRC imputed genotypes in UK Bio Bank. Um, and then later in 2019, uh, there is a method called Fast GWA and also developed to, to address similar challenges. And the difference is that Fast GWA proposed to use a sparse GRM instead of a dense GRM to further increase the efficiency of computation. And then in 2021, uh, Regeneron developed a, a software called Regini, which also addressed the similar challenges, but uh, with computation efficiency improvement uh, by using some uh, machine learning approaches uh, to you know, overcome the computation burden with fitting the logistic mix model. So um, these are all, like we have um, several uh, very efficient methods to allow us to conduct phenome-wide GWAS. So one challenge that I want to mention here is uh, for phenome-wide GWAS, we, we, we need to conduct thousands of GWAS. So it has even further requirement of the computation efficiency. And here's another example showing us how now we can use biobanks to study those less prevalent disorders. Uh, here's an example uh, for uh, fertility in males. As we see, we only have 63 cases in the UK biobank. And we conduct this GWAS in, uh, back in 2017 uh, when we tried to apply SAGE to UK biobank phenotypes, but we didn't know whether this signal is true or not until uh, in 2022, there's an independent lab that they have shown the protein is actually required for uh, pre-module uh, germ cell development. So which give us uh, you know, more confidence that, hey, let's use biobanks for, for those understudied disorders. Um, so and as we, um, yeah, question? Okay, uh, so um, as we uh, see that Here's a more, more challenges coming out when uh, biobanks starting to uh, generate you know, sequencing data. Uh, so as we see that sequencing data allow us to study rare variations. And before uh, sequencing data was generated, we uh, conduct our GWAS on uh, genotype data followed by imputation. So now sequencing data become available. Uh, we're able to study those less frequent and the rare variations. Uh, because of several good reasons, for example, unexplained heritability by common variants and precision medicine. And then we usually see those rare coding variants have more clear uh, function consequences. And, but this actually brings us uh, more challenge, uh, even though we have already tried to address the three different challenges in the phenome-wide GWAS in our biobanks, which is the single variant association test in which we Pass each genetic marker one at a time uh, are usually underpowered for those rare variations. And our solution is to how, to, how about group those rare variations based on some functional units to test them, for example, genes and epigenetic features. So the uh, most uh, simple uh, grouping test is the burden test that we uh, group, just uh, add them, the test statistic together with some weights, but burden test actually assumes that all genetic or rare variants uh, have the same effect size direction. And then it is more powerful when the uh, all very rare variants have non-zero effects on the phenotype. And in, in 2011, and Wu et al. has developed this method called SCAT test. And SCAT test is more powerful when uh, than burden test when uh, the rare variants in your testing set have different effect size directions. And then also it's, uh, it's more robust to the sparsity of the signals in the testing set. And in 2012, and uh, Lee et al. has developed the SCAT O test, which is an omnibus test combined SCAT and the burden. So it is more powerful in different scenarios of effect size direction and sparsity. And then in 2019, um, Liu et al. has developed this test called ACAT V test, which directly combines uh, the single variant p values based on a Cauchy distribution. And uh, it is very fast and much faster than SCAT O test. And it is, has been shown that it's more uh, robust to the high sparsity level of a signal in a set based test. So given that we have this many different set based tests we can use, uh, that's incorporated to our, to those tests to our 
um, the stage package and for uh, phenom-wide GWAS for, for, in biobanks for rare variants. So in 2020 and 2022, we have extended the stage framework for rare variations. And uh, so these are the, uh, I've, I've talked about four different challenges that we see in uh, phenom-wide GWAS and then how we try to address those challenges in, in different analytical tools. And next I would like to uh, have a very, very brief, uh, it's a tree using a tree structure to show you that there are way more other uh, tools that we can use uh, depend on, depending on what uh, you know, characteristics uh, we observed for in our data sets. So here's an example for quantitative traits, and depending on uh, whether you want to test common variants or rare variants, and whether there are related samples in the data set, and whether we have very large sample sizes in our study. So the reason why I want to mention these large sample sizes is that um, I've talked about different efficient methods that we developed for uh, FIGWAS in biobanks. But note that to increase computation efficiency and make, make them scalable for biobank scale data, we have used uh, several asymptotic uh, approaches to optimize our method. And those approaches might not work very well when the sample size is small. And also, if you don't have related samples in your data set, you don't have to use mixed models. So there are many other methods that have been developed to, um, uh, to uh, be used for different data sets. And the same for binary phenotypes. Uh, we have an extra challenge, which is case control imbalance. But as you see, if you don't have related samples and to account for case control imbalance, you can use SPA test, our package, which was developed uh, by, Lu by uh, Runek Day et al. And also you can use the P-Link software uh, with the first test, which also can, can account for case control imbalance. So I've added several reference lists here uh, for different methods if you are interested in knowing more details of those methods. And another point I want to mention is that we can see we have focused on quantitative and binary phenotypes at most. And uh, for quantitative phenotypes, we want to use linear regression model to model the relationship between genotype and phenotype. And for binary phenotype, we use logistic regression model. But there are other types of phenotypes uh, we can study when we curate uh, phenotypes from the EHRs. For example, the um, ordinal or categorical phenotypes, which are commonly used in uh, studies of, for example, mental disorders, and we, we can have different uh, degrees of depression, for example. And then uh, we have shown that if you just uh, simply treat them quantitative and uh, do inverse normalization, or treat them binary phenotype, that can harm the power. And so uh, for these type of phenotypes, we can use the proportional odds uh, logistic regression model to uh, model the relationship between genotype and phenotype. And another example is the type two event phenotype. So the idea is that um, usually the EHRs have dates associated with it. That give us opportunity to study you know, uh, disease progression, for example, or treatment responses. And we can leverage the time component to our genetic studies to study what genetics are associated with how fast or how slow the disease progress to some severe form. Uh, and then we uh, want to use the time to even phenotypes uh, for our, uh, for our uh, disease endpoint. And then in this, in, in this case, and we need to use survival analysis model for these phenotypes. So uh, that means that we, we, we need more methods for these different types of phenotypes. And uh, we have developed the, the package called POEM uh, with my colleague uh, Wenjian and my, uh, from my previous PhD lab. And uh, POEM has been extended to rare variants called POEM gene that you, both of the uh, methods that use the same mixed model framework implemented in SAGE so it is uh, quite straightforward to use them. And then um, in, uh, I also collaborate with Dr. Runak Day and Dr. Shi Hongling to develop the method called GATE and for time to even phenotype. So we can uh, use GATE for genome-wide survival analysis uh, to study genetics of disease progression. So these are more tools for different types of phenotypes if we uh, need in our studies. 
So next, I would like to uh, talk some talk about resources uh, that have been generated by large biobanks and uh, to, that performed uh, phenomite GWAS. Um, so uh, I will start with UK Biobank. As we as I just mentioned, that we applied uh, Sage to uh, 1,400 binary phenotypes in UK Biobank, and uh, they have been released. The summer statistics have been released to the research community to use in 2018. And then that also uh, re re put out another request for us to see how to visualize these results. So um, together with my colleagues at Michigan, and we have developed this uh, tool called uh, FIWAP that allow us to have interactive views of genetic associations in biobank uh, FIGWAS data. So here's the figure from the paper of FIWAP and uh, the first one, as we can see that, if we're interested in a phenotype, we can pull out the uh, Manhattan plot of this phenotype. And then if we are interested in certain region or certain locus, and we can then zoom in to have a local zoom plot. And then, um, as we see that uh, biobanks allow us to conduct a FIWAS studies. So if we click on any of the dots, uh, which, which is representing a genetic marker and to see, we, you can have this FIWAS plot and to see uh, which phenotypes or which human diseases are associated with, gene with this genetic marker. So uh, this, this tool has uh, quickly become very common, uh, be commonly used by other biobank studies and or other studies in UK biobank. For example, um, the uh, Neolab work and we have, uh, I want to mention that the Neolab has run uh, round one, round two, uh, phenome-wide GWAS of UK biobanks using unrelated samples. But very importantly, uh, they have conducted uh, sex stratified phenome-wide GWAS, which have been uh, rarely conducted in other biobank studies. And then uh, more recently, we have extended the um, work to more ancestry groups here at Broad, uh, led by Conrad, Alicia, and Ben, and Mark, and Hillary. So we call it Pan UK Biobank. And as you can see, we have conducted the phenomite GWAS across six continental ancestry groups. And then later, and Conrad has led the work to extend the, the phenomite GWAS to, to rare variations. And also they de developed um, more advanced visualization tools in this website for GeneBass that allow us to even more visualize the rare variations uh, based on different functional categories. So besides UK Biobank, there are many other biobanks have been cre generating the very valuable resource for us to use. And for example, the FinGen study has now released their uh, release 10 uh, genome-wide, you know, phenome-wide GWAS results and have the FIWAP uh, for, for us to browse. And also Michigan Genomic Initiative have, has built a similar FIWAP, and as long as Asian biobanks, uh, Biobank Japan, and Taiwan Biobank. And for MVP, we're going to uh, listen, uh, hear, hear more uh, in the next, uh, in our MPG talk today. So uh, very, at the end, I want to briefly touch on the biobank meta-analysis that we have actually given the entire MPG talk in the fall uh, that to show how we, we now can meta and analyze different biobanks to increase our power of genetic study. So uh, genetic uh, global biobank meta-analysis initiative was uh, initiated in 2019 and led by uh, PIs like Mark and Ben and uh, uh, Ida and Christine are from uh, University of Michigan and Alicia here. And our goal is to bring together those large biobanks to foster collaboration and foster different genetic discovery efforts uh, using biobanks. So uh, in our flagship project, we have 14 biobanks joined GBMI uh, from five different continents and with more than 2.2 million genetic genotype samples. And given that biobanks are so different in different aspects, so uh, we did some investigation evaluation on the integration of genetic discoveries from different biobanks, how, whether or how, what's the best practice to put them together. So we have uh, selected 14 different endpoints and then uh, we have shown that we do have improved the power when we put uh, those biobanks together. 
and by identifying you know, more uh, potentially novel loci, uh, 183 novel loci, and also we re re replicated the previously uh, reported loci. So this type of efforts also allow us to ask all different scientific questions. Uh, some are more focused on diseases, some are more focused on functional follow-up, phi mapping, and some are also focused on the disease prediction, uh, disease prediction models. So we have gained success in our flagship project, and uh, we re released our summary statistic for the research community to use. And uh, our ongoing work is, we have, as we see that, we have more biobanks included in GBMI, and we're trying to uh, extend our meta-analysis to phenome-wide, or as many as phenot as many uh, phenotypes as we can we can uh, do, we can study. And also, we extend our work to. Uh, incorporate social economic status to um, to disease prediction and also uh, conduct genetic studies for disease progression, uh, which is a great opportunity provided by the timestamped EHRs collected in biobanks. So another consortium is also led by uh, Brodies and uh, current or former Brodies here and uh, called Brava. It's a uh, uh, using a similar infrastructure of GBMI, but extend the efforts to rare variations by aggregating biobanks and studies together. So uh, I hope I have convinced you that biobanks uh, provide unprecedented opportunities for us and also pose analytical challenges for us to address for genetic discovery. And um, yeah, thank you. And I want to thank my uh, former advisors and mentors and collaborators from different biobanks, which set the basis of my uh, method development ap and application studies, and uh, also the GBMI biobanks and the biobank participants. Hey, thank you so much. That's an incredible resource. Uh, well, all together, many different resources that, that you were able to highlight and so many statistical models. Um, yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, yeah, really cool talk. Thank you. Um, I'm curious to know what's like, how large of a team you need to harmonize all the phenotypic data for GBMI? Yeah, so uh, it's a great question. And we, um, so the, the model we use to, for this collaboration efforts is uh, we, as a central analysis team, we have uh, four or five people and we try to, you know, curate phenotype definition based on fee code map and also customize some of the definitions based on the previous disease consortium. And then we uh, share these ICD codes. So as we can see, for each disease, we have two lists of ICD codes and one for, for including cases and one for excluding controls. And then we share these lists with analysts in different individual biobanks because we don't have access to the raw data for sure. And then they will curate the phenotypes uh, and then run GWAS. Thank you for a great talk as always. And I'm curious if you have any um, extension, extension idea for the phenotyping. So now we are using fee code as a um, kind of the standard binary outcomes for the fevers. But um, from your experience, do you think the fee code um, sufficiently capture the variety of the phenotypes in the biobank? So, and also if you have any further idea to more capture the diversity of the disease in the biobank? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I think the one main reason we chose fee code is that we have systematic mapping. So uh, there is a R, pa R package developed for analysts to curate phenotypes directly, you know, using IC codes uh, according to fee code. So uh, it is easy for us to do some analysis at scale, uh, but definitely because Fee code, uh, IC codes, the purpose of IC codes is for billing and instead of uh, research. So we do see that there are some uh, even, even mistakes in the ICD codes input. And so uh, I guess that's a, a trade off between uh, the you know, collaborative efforts and, uh, and, the, and the accuracy. And for example, in our first round of GBMI, and we didn't request the 
you know, at least two occurrences of, IC, uh, of vehicles. So uh, we, are, we are definitely incorporating that more stringent standard in our next rounds of studies. And then we also explore uh, different types of uh, clinical data other than fecal, uh, fecal and ICD codes because, for example, in um, many biobanks uh, out, of, out of the America and, the, and Europe, and they are not using ICD codes at all. So they have, for example, questionnaire data uh, for self-report information. And we also you know, take those GWAS based on these types of uh, self-report data and then try to evaluate uh, the consistency of effect sizes, for example, uh, to see uh, how we can best incorporate different resources of, of clinical data. Um, we do see for some diseases, um, self-report data might uh, have attenuated effects, effects, for example, for asthma, uh, because most of the ICD codes we got uh, in, in biobanks, they are uh, hospitalized cases. So that represent more severe form of certain diseases uh, versus like self-report might be uh, not, that, not the case. So uh, I guess that really incorporating other types of uh, clinical data for GWAS really require more people to work together. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for a great talk. One quick question. So it's really nice to see a great initiative to do you know, like a meta-analysis for disease and clinical phenotype. Do you think it's possible to make this kind of a global initiative for molecular traits such as EQTL? And what kind of challenge you see if that's going to happen? That's a great question. I think that's a really ideal scenario if we can uh, extend this meta-analysis work to more EQTL or molecular phenotypes. But based on my experience is the, on the molecular phenotype field, we have less you know, current effort for the meta-analysis. Uh, and also we have, we need to pay more attention or have more considerations on the phenotype, uh, for example, harmonization, because molecular phenotypes can depend on all different conditions. Uh, yeah, like different cells and tissues that will require more, more work. And that's my hope. And then I'm also very interested in this area. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yeah. Bit of a statistical model question, which is as we start to go maybe for some efforts incorporating more and more direct exome and genome sequencing with less imputation, how does that affect which models are most appropriate to use, especially for rare variants? Yeah, that's a great question because um, yeah, we have also uh, have also thought about this uh, when we developed the uh, Sage Gene and Sage Gene Plus, because at the time when we started develop Sage Gene and evaluated in UK Biobank data, and we don't have access to any sequencing data, so we ended up saw that imputation data, and we have dosages that is uh, can be a, a float in float you know uh, places float number and. Uh, instead of integers, and uh, and also imputation quality tend to be poor <laughs> in rare variants. So when we develop methods and we need to handle uh, one specific example is that for uh, rare variants and with, for example, myelial count 10, it's not necessarily like 10 carriers for this variant if we use imputation data. It can have very small dosage, like 0.2 across or hundreds of participants. And how, whether we, uh, the reason why we include that variance is because the imputation quality score passed the cutoff. But how do we you know, clean the dosages uh, like for a, 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 you know, QC, a further QC? And then what we did is uh, we uh, say, oh, any dosage be below 0.2 and for rare variants, say, with my little count less than 10, that's tended to zero. <laughs> and we we'll try our best to uh, handle this imputation quality issue of rare variants. And whereas the sequencing um, data have the, you know, do, do not have this, this problem.
I had a, another question related to the model and the technical details. In the very beginning, you showed us a plot of if you were to do this with a non-optimized method, it would take like half a terabyte of memory and 100 years to do. For these new methods that you talked about, um, can you exp could you give an idea of like how long it will take and what sort of resources you will need to do these analyses? Are they accessible to the mortals around us rather than the gods? Yeah, definitely. That's a great question. I had a table uh, to show the benchmark of computation. And then so, you know, original stage paper, I think um, it take like three, if I remember it correctly, 300 CPU hours to conduct one GWAS. Uh, yeah, and then it actually decreases a lot uh, when we try to improve our uh, method. And then uh, now it's, I, I would say for white bridge samples, it will take uh, 50 or 60 CPU, around 50 or 60 CPU hours. And uh, if we use no sparse GRM and then more observation of the, um, of the association test. Um, but uh, the same with the, the other methods like Regini and then faster GWA. There are lots of studies to the benchmark of those methods and to show, hey, we, when we, if we add this, this approach, we can further increase the computation <laughs> efficiency. But uh, I would say that uh, if, if my memory is not accurate, but I can definitely say the, uh, these methods are definitely be, uh, be accessible to, uh, to the individual users that who, who are only interested in one or several diseases. You again for a lovely talk um, and it's the perfect segue to going into the um, million veterans project that we'll hear about next so please grab another coffee um, and uh, we'll reconvene at 9 30.